Hello students, welcome to this gene lecture entitled The Genetics of GI Disorders. My name is Jeff, let's get started. Here are your learning objectives. We're going to compare and contrast the genetic disorders related to heme metabolism to include Krigler, Niyar, and Gilbert's syndromes. We're also going to examine UDP glucuronosyl transferase related disorders including Dubin Johnson and Roter's syndrome. Moreover, we're going to compare and contrast the genetic disorders related to iron and copper metabolism, including hemochromatosis and Wilson disease. The reading assignment is Medical Biochemistry, an Illustrated Review by Panini. I've identified some supplemental materials for your perusal and board exam preparation. I've created a playlist at osmosis.org entitled Dr. Stottinger's Genetics of GI Disorders, Osmosis Playlist and Practice Questions. If you click on this link, the playlist will be revealed to you. Again, please note this is supplemental material for your perusal and board exam preparation. I've placed additional board style practice questions at the end of this lecture. Again, these are supplemental practice questions for your perusal and board exam preparation. In order to understand the genetics of GI disorders, you need to have a clear understanding of biotransformation pathways in the liver and intestine. I'd like to start this lecture with a discussion of clinically relevant drug-drug, food-drug, and herb-drug interactions. The question is being asked, how did I get pregnant while I was on the pill? Many folks self-medicate with herbal remedies to include one called St. John's wort. It's available over-the-counter at health stores, Folks self-medicate for depression, among other things. The biologically active substituents of St. John's wort include two compounds, hyperforin and hyperisin. It turns out these compounds induce the mRNA expression of CYP3A4 drug metabolizing enzyme activity. This enzyme is central in the biotransformation of pharmacological agents that clinicians prescribe and pharmacists dispense. It turns out this induction of CYP3A4 drug metabolism in the patient's body chews up the birth control, which is a steroid. And this lowers the level of the birth control in serum and decreases its effectiveness. This is a classic case of herb-drug interaction in your future patients. The other mechanism of drug-drug interaction includes competitive inhibition of CYP3A enzymes. These concepts will be discussed more broadly in second year pharmacology lectures. However, I wanted to introduce you to the notion here for your consideration. It's important to understand there are 57 CYP genes in the human genome. And if you click on this link, an article entitled Human Cytochromes P450 in Health and Disease will be revealed to you. Great foundational material for you to understand deeply second year pharmacology lectures. A brief introduction to the biochemistry of cytochrome P450 enzyme function. NADPH derived from the pentose phosphate pathway donates two electrons to a companion enzyme, cytochrome P450 reductase. These electrons are combined with oxygen in the presence of heme in the cytochrome P450 enzyme to convert a lipophilic substrate into a hydroxylated form a more polar metabolite that is more readily excreted. In combination, water is produced. In our example, birth control eventually gets hydroxylated and excreted. That is how induction of cytochrome P450 increases the metabolism and decreases the effectiveness of the drug in our example. This process is also referred to as oxidative metabolism. This process is fundamental in the overall process called biotransformation. To summarize, an obligate pair of enzymes, cytochrome P450 reductase paired with cytochrome P450, produces the hydroxylated form of birth control and water. The overall reaction can be summarized here. Any drug combines with molecular oxygen and uses energy from NADPH to produce the hydroxylated form of the drug and water. The remarkable thing about cytochrome P450 enzymes, also called SIPs, is that they catalyze numerous types of chemical reactions. 
hydroxylation of an aliphatic or aromatic carbon, again referred to as oxidative metabolism. There are other reactions that these enzymes can perform listed here. A truly remarkable enzyme, a truly versatile enzyme. Another remarkable aspect of this family of enzymes is that it represents the largest gene family in the known universe. In other words, all life in the known universe contains cytochrome's P450 enzymes. Evolution is a marvelous thing. I provide here a pictorial representation of the biotransformation pathways in humans through cytochrome P450 enzymes. Again, physicians prescribe and pharmacists dispense the drug, which goes through phase one oxidative metabolism to produce a hydroxylated form of the drug. It turns out these hydroxylation reactions form the active site for secondary or phase two conjugated metabolism to include glucuronidation, sulfonation, or glutathione conjugation. The point is subsequent reactions occur following phase one. They are called phase two reactions. So-called phase three reactions encompass the function of drug transporter enzymes and drug efflux pumps. This is how compounds get out of the body via urine, feces, sweat, breath, and saliva. This is the process of biotransformation. Overall, biotransformation converts a relatively fat-soluble drug or compound into a relatively more water-soluble compound that is thus able to be excreted from our bodies. Among the superfamily of CYP enzymes is CYP3A4. It's a heme-containing protein enriched in liver and intestine. It ranks first in catalytic versatility and ranks first in the number of drugs and foreign compounds that it detoxifies or activates. Incidentally, medicinal chemists take advantage of this enzyme as well as other enzymes to convert prodrugs into the active form of the drug using our own body's biochemistry to achieve this. Many of the drugs that you will prescribe are themselves prodrugs that rely on our body's biochemistry to convert the prodrug to the active form of the drug. CYP3A4, as you'll learn in second year, is among the most important cytochrome P450 enzymes. It's heavily enriched in the gastrointestinal system and metabolizes numerous drugs, some of which are listed here. There are additional drugs listed here. I think you can appreciate the versatility of the CYP3A4 enzyme. Fully 40% of the wet weight of your liver is comprised of CYP3A4 enzyme. It is heavily enriched in liver as well as in intestine. I'd like to talk about common examples of inducers and inhibitors associated with CYP3A4. Inducers work at the level of gene expression. That is, the gene that encodes CYP3A is increased by the presence of these drugs. Whereas inhibitors interface with the ligand binding pocket of cytochrome P450 enzymes and slow down their substrate metabolism. This is particularly important when folks are on combination therapy. Not to imply that CYP3A4 is the only drug biotransforming enzyme in liver and intestine. There are many listed here. We will focus our efforts on understanding phase one biotransformation in that it introduces a functional group that produces a small increase in hydrophilicity. Our focus will remain on cytochrome P450 enzymes. Phase two reactions also function, but they produce a large increase in hydrophilicity and they follow phase one reactions typically. We'll focus our understanding on phase two reactions, specifically glucuronide conjugation. But to remind you, phase three biotransforming drug transporter proteins function to move these compounds across cellular membranes in an active or facilitated manner. I'd like to delve into some more specifics regarding phase three drug transporter proteins and their role in drug development. Shown here is an, a diagram depicting intestinal epithelia, hepatocytes, kidney proximal tubules, and the blood-brain barrier. 
These drug transporter proteins are major determinants of the pharmacokinetic safety and efficacy profile of drugs. Among the transporters we'll talk about today are OATPs, MRP2, PGP, and they are located differentially across tissues. These drug transporter proteins are implicated in the drug-drug interactions of a number of widely prescribed drugs, and they also represent a significant challenge and therapeutic barrier to the pharmaceutical industry as well as to your patients. Briefly, many of these drug transporters are uptake transporters. For example, the OATPs in liver move compounds from the blood into the hepatocyte where they can be eventually excreted into bile. So in patients on combination therapy where both are substrates for OATP proteins, you can see that the uptake of one drug could potentially be inhibited by administration of another drug. This is especially important in elderly patients, cancer patients, HIV patients, immunocompromised patients who are on numerous prescription medications, some of which interact at the level of these transporters. With all of that information in mind, let's compare and contrast the genetic disorders related to heme metabolism, including krigler nayar and Gilbert's disease, Dubin-Johnson syndrome, and Rotor syndrome. Krigler Niar is an autosomal recessive and inherited disorder that affects the metabolism of bilirubin to produce non hemolytic jaundice and higher than normal levels of unconjugated bilirubin in the serum. This can cause kernicterus or brain damage in infants. A typical vignette for Krigler Niar might be an infant is brought to the pediatrician by his parents because they're concerned about the yellow color of his skin and general behavior changes. They report that he just seems more tired and weak and his arms are just flopping down by his side instead of him reaching out for his toys. The parents are known to be first cousins. These are the key aspects of this vignette. This condition presents early in life and can result in brain damage in infancy. There's two types, type 1 or type 2. Type 1 is characterized by severe jaundice and kernicterus, which is bilirubin-induced brain dysfunction. Type 2 is less severe, also referred to as Arius syndrome. In order to understand krigler niar you need to understand there are families of UDP glucuronosyl transferase enzymes. This is a phase 2 enzyme whose function is to merely stick sugar groups on foreign compounds, drugs, bile acids, other endogenous biomolecules, this family of enzymes is key in converting fat-soluble drugs into water-soluble compounds that can be excreted by our bodies. In particular, there are two subfamilies of UGT enzymes, the UGT1 and UGT2 subfamily. Again, UGT is UDP glucuronosyl transferase. With respect to krigler niar UGT1A1 is the most important enzyme, as this enzyme is the one that conjugates glucose to bilirubin. Said another way, conjugated bilirubin is UGT1A1's product. However, please understand that UGTs all have a broad substrate selectivity. Bilirubin is not the only thing that UGT1 sticks a sugar group on. Many xenobiotics, foreign compounds, drugs, and endobiotics also undergo this type of biotransformation. Let's get into the specifics of krigler niar and UGT1A1. In type 1 krigler niar a mutation in UGT1A1 enzyme renders its activity null, totally absent, or the gene is not expressed at all. In type 2, also called Arias syndrome, the mutation in the coding region renders the enzyme defective and less active than normal, but these patients retain UGT1A1 activity at some level. Here's a picture of the reaction that UGT1A1 does. Heme is broken down to biliverdin, which is converted to bilirubin, then UGT1A1 produces bilirubin glucuronides, in other words, 
bilirubin with sugar conjugated onto it. Literally, it's just glucose. This molecule is highly water soluble and our bodies are able to excrete it. As I told you earlier, these enzymes have broad substrate selectivity. For example, aronotecan is worked on by an intestinal enzyme called carboxylesterase to produce SN38. In other words, aronotecan is a prodrug that's converted to the active form of the drug, which is then acted upon by hepatic UGT1A1 to produce the glucuronide, which can be excreted in bile and feces. The glucose molecule can be seen here, stuck on SN38. The overall reaction is shown here. SN38 plus UDP glucuronate produces SN38 glucuronide plus UDP. This is how glucose gets stuck on drugs and how drugs then are rendered substrates for drug transporters. So these compounds are then excreted in bile and feces. Your future patients that present with Krigler Nayar will have neonatal jaundice, sepsis, hypotonia, kernicterus. On physical exam, they'll appear yellow and some will have an oculomotor palsy. With respect to prognosis, prevention, and complications, kernicterus is the main complication. This results from elevated bilirubin in the blood that eventually gets deposited in brain. This can produce poor development and poor mental function in neonates. If severe and untreated, patients will die within a few years. To treat, we can use plasmapheresis, phototherapy, also called the Billy lights. This is UV light therapy. UV light breaks down conjugated bilirubin in the skin of neonates. This is a therapy for jaundice. Treatment with phenobarbital is a UGT1A1 gene expression inducer. This only works for type 2. Phenobarbital treatment results in increased UGT mRNA synthesis and UGT activity. If this condition progresses to a certain point, the only treatment option you have is a liver transplant. That comprises the relationship between UGT1A1 and krigler niar type 1 and type 2. Let's talk about Gilbert's syndrome. Gilbert's syndrome may present with a yellowing or jaundice in the eyes of your future patients. Here is a typical vignette. A 24-year-old third-year med student is two weeks into her first surgery rotation when her senior resident tells her that her eyes look a little yellow. She experienced her first needle stick injury in the operating room just one week earlier and begins to worry about hepatitis. Other than rarely having the time to eat at work, she has no other complaints or symptoms. Stressful situation, jaundiced eyes, needle stick injury, rarely having the time to eat. Gilbert syndrome is a hereditary condition in which unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia occurs. And this is due to a defect in the gene promoter for UGT1A1. The promoter is that region of the gene that controls gene expression. What you see is mild decrease in UDP glucuronosyl transferase activity, and that's due to lower expression of the wild type enzyme. You see a mild decrease in bilirubin uptake in these patients autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive inheritance. It's actually very common in our population. In Gilbert syndrome, patient presentation includes mild symptoms. These patients are largely asymptomatic, but can have occasional recurrent mild jaundice. This condition presents and is associated with fasting. A plausible hypothesis regarding the mechanism suggests that the fasting state and increased hepatic uptake of non-esterified fatty acids interferes with the hepatic clearance of bilirubin and thus contributes to the unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia of fasting. Stress, aka med school versus infection with a needle stick should be considered. In addition to stress, ethanol intake is associated with patient presentation in those that have Gilbert's syndrome. Diagnosis of Gilbert's syndrome includes isolated unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia without evidence of hepatitis or hemolysis. There's a fasting test. There's also a rifampicin test that can be used to diagnose Gilbert's disease. In Gilbert's syndrome, 
there's no treatment needed. With respect to prognosis, prevention, and complications, there are no clinical consequences. However, patients must avoid certain medications, for example, aronatecan, because of reduced UGT activity. These patients' ability to clear certain medications will be somewhat compromised, and they'll be at increased risk for toxicity. Shown pictorially, patients with Gilbert syndrome are unable to produce the glucuronide efficiently. Thus, SN38 will back up, and this compound is incredibly toxic. Students, let's talk about Dubin-Johnson and Rotor syndrome. Dubin-Johnson and Rotor syndrome. Here's a typical vignette. A 22-year-old motorcycle accident victim with unknown past medical history is brought to the ED with severe head injuries. He is stabilized and brought to the surgical ICU where he's deemed to be brain dead by both the intensivist and the neurosurgery staff. The organ transplant team is contacted and determined that he is an eligible kidney donor. However, he is not eligible for liver donation. Upon entering the abdomen during harvest, the team notices that his liver is black. Key aspects, severe head injuries, eligible kidney donor, not liver because it's black. This patient has Dubin-Johnson due to mutations in the gene for MRP2, multi-drug resistance associated protein number two. Rotor syndrome, by contrast, your patients will have mutations in OATP1B1 and 1B3. To review our previous slide, Multi-drug resistant associated protein 2 is a member of the superfamily of ATP binding cassette, also called ABC transporter family. These ABC proteins transport various molecules across extra and intracellular membranes. OATPs, also called organic anion transporting polypeptides, form a family of influx transporters expressed in various tissues important for pharmacokinetic properties of drugs. Of the 11 human OATP transporters, 1B1 and 1B3 and 2B1 are expressed on the sinusoidal membrane of hepatocytes and facilitate the liver uptake of their substrate drugs. Here is a picture of what a typical patient's liver will look like with Dubin-Johnson syndrome. To give you another view, you can see the black liver and under the microscope, this is what you might see. The presence of this black is due to the deposition of a pigmented substance. The presence of conjugated hyperbilirubinemia is due to the decreased hepatic excretion conjugated bilirubin in Dubin-Johnson syndrome. There are two types, Dubin-Johnson and Rotor's syndrome. Dubin-Johnson is characterized by a grossly black liver due to impaired excretion of epinephrine metabolites. This condition is benign and is inherited in an autosomal recessive manner. Rotor's syndrome, by contrast, is much milder than Dubin-Johnson and does not cause a black liver. Rotor syndrome is symptomatically similar to Dubin-Johnson's, save for the fact that the liver is histologically normal and does not present as black. Rotor syndrome is a benign condition with a normal life expectancy and no specific therapy is required. Rotor syndrome is caused by having mutations in both the 1B1 and 1B3 OATP genes. This results in impaired secretion and or impaired storage of bilirubin in liver and it's characterized by a predominantly conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. However, patients are generally asymptomatic. You may find some incidental jaundice more than 50% of the serum bilirubin is conjugated. Bilirubin urea is typically present in these patients. Rotor's syndrome patient presentation. Most patients are asymptomatic, although they may become jaundiced or icteric during fatigue, pregnancy, or with oral contraceptives due to a reduction in hepatic excretory function. Your patient may show direct hyperbilirubinemia, increased total bilirubin, especially in Dubin-Johnson syndrome, and total urine and the coproporphyrin 3 to 1 ratio ranges from 1, 1 to 3 to 1 to 4. This is opposite of normal. Total urine coproporphyrin levels are elevated in rotors, but normal in Dubin-Johnson syndrome. In Dubin-Johnson's, the gross pathology is a dead giveaway. Dark black liver in Dubin-Johnson syndrome. Learning, objective, 
2. We're going to compare and contrast the genetic disorders related to iron and copper metabolism, including hemochromatosis and Wilson disease. Here are your readings. And as a reminder, here are two supplemental videos from osmosis describing hemochromatosis and Wilson disease for your perusal. If you click on each link, a video will be revealed to you along with flashcards and complex level questions. Here's a typical vignette. 33 year old female is referred to a neurologist by her primary care physician for an unsteady gait forgetfulness and recent episodes of Tourette-like spells where she will fling one arm out and above her head seemingly unprovoked. On physical exam, the neurologist notices that her irises appear multicolored with concentric rings around the periphery. He's concerned for a metabolic disease and orders several laboratory and radiologic studies. In the interim, he has advised her to avoid eating chocolate and shellfish. These are foods that are usually high in copper, especially organ meats, shellfish, dried beans, peas, whole wheat, and chocolate, especially dark chocolate. The patient's drinking water should likely be analyzed because it may contain too much copper. The blue denotes salient aspects of this vignette. As an introduction, Wilson disease manifests in free copper accumulation in many tissues in your future patients to include liver, brain, cornea, joints. This disease is also known as hepatolenticular degeneration. The cause is mutation in ATP7B, a copper transporter transmembrane protein. Mutation in this gene results in inadequate copper excretion by the liver into the bile. It also produces a failure of copper to enter circulation bound to ceruloplasmin. Ceruloplasmin is the transport protein for copper, just like transferrin is for iron. Copper bound to ceruloplasmin normally represents the largest fraction of copper in the body. Unbound copper generates free radicals that damage tissues. It has an autosomal recessive inheritance pattern. In normal hepatocytes in patients without Wilson's disease, the ATPase is located in the trans-Golgi network, right here, into which it transports copper for incorporation eventually into ceruloplasmin, and it's secreted into the blood for transport throughout the body. Mutations in ATP7B may interfere with some or all of its complex functions in hepatocytes. What's interesting is there's a specialized bile canaliculus you'll see here located adjacent to tight junctions where copper is excreted into bile. And if you click on this link, the reference will be revealed to you. In this picture, what you see is a ribbon type diagram of ATP7B. This transporter uses ATP to pump copper into bile and plasma. Wilson's disease manifests in CNS disorders, behavioral changes, dystonia, dysarthria, and everything listed here. In particular, the Kaiser Fleischer rings are a hallmark of Wilson disease. You can see that ring here. In blue-eyed folks, it's a little more pronounced and easily seen. It presents with Parkinson's-like symptoms, hemibilismus, dementia. On physical exam, your patients will have cirrhosis and Kaiser Fleischer rings. These rings are rarely seen in other conditions. Labs associated with Wilson disease include decreased total serum copper, increased serum non ceruloplasmin bound copper, increased urine and serum-free copper, and hemolytic anemia. If you did a liver biopsy, you would see increased hepatic copper. Treatment is with chelation. Ammonium tetrathiomolybdate facilitates urinary excretion of copper. Penicillamine is another copper chelating agent, as is trientine. Zinc can be a treatment for Wilson disease. Zinc competes with copper for absorption in the gut via ATPB 
seven. Finally, clinicians might consider liver transplantation as the condition warrants. There are risk factors for several other diseases associated with Wilson disease to include hepatitis, cirrhosis, and hepatocellular carcinoma. These folks are also at risk for Fanconi's disease of the proximal tubules. Please take note of the board-style practice questions appended at the end of the PowerPoint. 